the more we yield to Him, the greater the arena of protectiveness that comes over us and around us. Yahweh will purposely protect us because we're part of the pride of the Lion of Judah. And, and so he, he overshadows us. He watches us. He roars over us. I, the, the, the lion, is, to me, is, is a terrifying beast, but it's the most loving and amazing with all of its cubs. It, you know, sometimes it will give its life to try and provide, you know, which is what Yeshua really did. He gave his life to provide a way for us. Today, I, I want to talk a little bit about who our Father really is. You know, we, we, we see Him as God. We experience Him as Lord. We experience Him in the sovereignty and the way that He moves. We experience His power. We feel Him at times in worship, and He's our God. But for me, one of the greatest changes that has gone on in my life has been about getting with Yahweh to know that He's my Father, not just my God and my King and my Lord and my Savior, but to actually get to know Him as my Father. And so as, as, as that revelation for me has really unlocked over the last 20 years, um, I've come to realize the, the importance about our union with Him and what it's going to mean to the future for us to be one with Him and then to have that full measure of Godhoodness materializing here in creation. So if God is our Father, then we are going to look like Him. We're going to function like Him. Not only are we going to be able to do what He's doing, but we will be where He is. You know, the Word says that if you and I are in Him, then it means that we're in the Father's omnipresent. It means that we will be able to be everywhere doing the same things that Yahweh is doing through observance of being within Him to frame this world and reset creation into place. I am so looking forward to reframing a new heaven and a new earth in the right way, not in a fallen state, and creating that further state of creation where, where we come into the full measure of what Yahweh is doing. I, I can remember the, you know, the, the religious system I grew up in in the Baptist church. Praise the Lord. It was great to get some of the foundations from them. Didn't really like their business meetings. Didn't like the, you know, the way that they did all their stuff, and that was okay. But I, I can remember growing up in the Baptist system and the, the fear I had of God. Like, they, they, they're like it was hell and brimstone, you know, and damnation and all of these things that kind of were preached in the church. And, 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 and it was like, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And this was in 1989. And so we expected in the year of 1989 the world to finish because Kissinger was in power and his name meant the devil. And so the devil was on the throne and that, you know, the world was going to finish. Well, it's now 2017, some 37 years later, we're still here. And so I realized that a lot of the stuff I was taught back in those days really was a load of hogwash, or what they would call now minutia mantle. And so, so <laughs> yeah, sorry, Vaughn's just laughing. Yes, I'm glad there's someone else here that can appreciate my humor. And so um, I, I, I can remember coming into the place where um, the religious system had taught me that I couldn't see God. I couldn't experience Him. It would only, <clears throat> it would only ever really happen when I died or, 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 or in that arena of the, of the world where, where God would... Excuse me, I'm just getting a, um, a thieves lozenger. Where, 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 where if only if I died would I ever see God. Only if I died would I ever have my full measure of redemption. Only if I died would I ever be free from this mortal body of sin. Only if I ever died. And so... In the programming system of the religious structure I was under, I came to the point where um, I, I, I made a decision that if I'm going to die, the best place to die is in the presence of God. And so I can remember reading through Exodus and seeing how Moses spoke to God and then kind of walking my way through many, many years of trying to figure out who this God was. And then, you know, 15 years ago, coming to that point of encounter um, and I've done the teaching on it being in the dark cloud. I think it might be coming up. I can't remember when it is. But about being in that dark cloud and the surrounding swirl of the what I call the kiss of Yahweh's goodness so that when He shows up in His personhood, we don't die. And I can remember getting to the point of making decisions to go through that veil and to engage with God and walking into this little cabin, cabin that was in the middle of the swirling mass of clouds 
and, and Yahweh was in the middle, and, and of course I share in there about him crying and saying, you know, it's the first time since anyone has been his son, and, and then me going out and then coming back in again and going out and coming back in, and through the next ensuing several years, going in and out of that arena until I kind of got to the stage where I would look at his feet, you know, and then look at his, his waist and fascinated with the way he looked, and, uh, and I've described, some people said to me one day, can you describe what Yahweh looks like? His skin, and so I would describe it as a woven mat of diamonds, all framed together, deep blue with fire and the colors of the rainbow all moving in it. It's only way I can describe his skin in the terms that we have here that could help. It's like looking at a brilliant triple A blue diamond in the middle of a sun and holding it up and then trying to figure out how to describe color. And, and so I was kind of looking at his feet and looking up, and eventually I got to the point where I, I thought, well, if I die, I couldn't die in any better place. I made a choice to let go, and I lifted my eyes, and I looked at his face. And when I did, the greatest thing happened with me was that I got caught with his eyes. You know, the word says that the eyes are the window to our soul. And I can remember looking into the eyes of Yahweh, and so longing to be in there that I found myself starting to go into the realm that was inside God. And um, I, I really did. I, I went through this thought process. I have three young children, nine, seven, and five. And if I die, then they're going to be left without a dad. But then it doesn't really matter because if I die here, then, then God's going to take care of them. And I was in that kind of a far state of just literally starting to lose my hold on this creative realm we live in here in a physical form and i can remember getting closer and closer and closer into the the glory that was within the personhood of yahweh still looking through his eye and then i got distracted thank you jesus i got distracted and what distracted me was that although the eyes stayed the same the face of god was moving and morphing and it was going lion Ox, eagle, man, lion, ox, eagle, man. And I, in my head, I did this backtrack. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, because now I wasn't looking at his eye. I wasn't going anywhere near where he was. And I'm backtracking, trying to look at, at what was going on here until I could watch his face. And his face was changing. Lion, ox, eagle, man, lion, ox. And I was, I was absolutely fascinated and in awe of what I was beholding. But the one thought that went through my brain was, how come no one has ever told me this is how I'm going to look? How come no one has ever told me in all my years of experience, in all the years of walking with God, how come no one's ever said, I've never heard it preached anywhere that I am going to look like my father, that I'm going to, as I behold him as in a mirror, I get changed into his image from glory to glory. How come no one's ever told me about the image of God? How come no one's ever spoken to me about what we are going to look like? I don't know about you, but I, I'm, I went through this after that experience. I went back in again and again and again and again, trying to get to grips with what it means to have a different DNA, to have this intrinsic change take place within us, to be able to become like him and behold the goodness of Yahweh here in the land of the living. I've no doubt that other men of old had touched into some of these things. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the four faces of God and just really, really what it means. Man, I don't believe I've been speaking for 15 minutes already. Um, just, just about the four faces of God, what they really mean. Um, I, I, I want to really shake for me, I want to shake your image that you have of God from a, a meek, um, weak, mild God to a, to a fierce, uninhibited, unrestrained, strong, forceful, and fiery, loving God. You know, so often we have this image of, of Yeshua hanging on the cross or as a little child, I can remember growing up in the Baptist church and people would teach me about, you know, the, the um, Jesus in the manger. They never really talked about Jesus after the resurrection. They talked about Jesus in the manger and Jesus dying, but they never really talked about him passing through death to show us the other side 
of what it means and why he actually came. And so for me, some of my images of God of, through Yeshua were just this, this mild, meek, meek-mannered, loving God who just was really fluffy, duffy. And, and I, I, I went through a metamorphosis in seeing him there. And, and for me, when I saw him, it, it shook me to the foundations of my belief systems. It shook me to my core for me to realize that as he is, so am I in this life. So let's just talk about, a little bit about angels here. Angels are things that are, are beings that are supposed to reflect the image of God. They're the only ones that have been created and made that have the capacity to reflect externally the, the image of God from an internal position that they have in their servitude towards Yahweh. And that's why when an angel, is, when you see an angel, generally it's glowing white and has a radiance that comes out from inside of its being, and that's usually the presence of God. Um, the, the word does say very, very clear that we are going to get changed into his likeness from glory to glory or into his image from glory to glory, which really means that you and I are going to go through an intrinsic change that for me, will not happen all of a sudden. Suddenly, it'll be like, I'll be Ian in the flesh, and then suddenly, one day, I'm going to be Ian, Ian Godhoodness in the flesh, fully revealed. The Bible says, glory to glory, line upon line, precept to precept. So for me, it's little incremental changes that affect your life that will empower us to become who we're going to be. And so it's those little changes that are so, so important. Um, I, I often wonder about Moses' face and, and why, why Moses' face actually shone. Would like in the Bible it says it shone, so they, they put a veil over his face because, he's, because of his, his face shining. When you go into the original translation of some of the scriptures, it was, it's got nothing to do with him shining, although it has. But the real issue was the, the morphing of Moses' face that affected people around him so much. And the reason that he had been affected, Moses himself had been affected by Yahweh, was because Moses had been up into those mountains, up in before the presence of the Lord, then up with Joshua into a mountain, then up himself into another mountain, which is actually to do with the governmental seats of Yahweh, but also to do with a relational connection where Yahweh spoke to him face to face for 40 days and 40 nights. I have never known another person to be in that world sovereignly and engage with Yahweh, well, not necessarily sovereignly, purposefully with intent, engaging with Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights in that world. And when Moses came out of the world, he, his DNA was so affected by his entanglement with Yahweh that he changed, his image completely changed from what he was, a human being into this being. And when you look into some of the original scriptures and the way that they talk about what, he's, what, what it was. It talks about these images or talks about these horn-like appearances or these, this, this, this morphing, this process that was going on with Moses' DNA. The word says this, as we behold him, you know, we, we become like what we behold. One of the, the first, most frustrating things for me has been the way that the church system has not taught believers how to behold Yahweh. They've taught him and they taught believers how to hear the voice of God, which really negates the whole thing of priesthood and stops us being who we really are and what we're going to become, because we will become what we behold. And so our whole job really as a priest is to go in and behold Yahweh to engage with him. The Bible says about Moses that Yahweh spoke to him face to face, that he spoke to his servant Moses face to face, which is a whole lot of mystery really as well as as well as the ability to visibly see Yahweh's face and for Yahweh to be speaking face to face. Um, I've never done that for, for me personally, where I've engaged with the presence of God like that. I've never done it for more than three hours in my own, own, at any one time. Moses did this for 40 days and 40 nights. No wonder he was affected to bear the image of his God that he had been beholding over that time. Really, what Moses was doing was becoming 
like a cherub, becoming like the look of the cherubim with the faces of God. When you go into the book of Ezekiel, you find that the, the, the immature son on the throne, the governing seat from Ezekiel 1, I've started teaching on it, so very soon you better get the, the um, teachings on it. But um, the, the, the lion, the ox, eagle, man, how the, the cherubim moved with lion, ox, eagle, man, the reason that their faces were moving like that is because they've been beholding him for so long. It really makes me wonder the beauty of the way Lucifer would have looked before he fell or the way that the beauty of the, of the other archangel that would have been over the Ark of the Covenant, which is now Melchizedek, it makes me wonder what, what they would have looked like from the year, from, I mean, in timeline. I mean, there's no time frame really in the, in the days of old or in the beginning, but for how, how long they were there, how long this, this radiance that they were observing and what they took on to bear that image. And so you become what you look like. And so when you see the way the angelic realm looks and some of the, some of the beings that have been around Yahweh for so long, at least you have some idea um, of what's going on. Um, when, when, when Yahweh invades our realm, there is an external manifestation of His presence. But when we invade God's realm... There's an invisible internal manifestation that works out to the external. And so it's about us going into that realm to work in what we behold so that here, when we're on earth, it will become as it is in heaven. And so it's this beholding process that becomes really, really important. Um, it's really interesting, the ex external manifestation and the internal revelation and the beholding actually do go hand in hand. You cannot have one really without the other. And so there's an invasion of Yahweh into your world and there's an invasion of you into Yahweh's world. And because they're working simultaneously, it's just like Yeshua said, um, I cannot go and, sorry, the Holy Spirit cannot come lest I go. And, and so in the exchange process, when Yeshua went up and the Holy Spirit came down, for me, it's like that exchange process. As we go up into Him, He comes down and reveals Himself in us. And then there's an external manifestation of that revealing because then it's on earth as it is in heaven. And it's this process to me that, that, that has become important. Um, it's, it's one of the key facets of, of Moses speaking with Yahweh and, and engaging with Yahweh that way really was the, the issue of the image. Um, the, the, it's really, it's the image of Christ being formed in us. Um, it's about us invading, but it's also about Him inviting. So there's an invitation and there's a, a, a tentative invading of Yahweh's space where you set your intent and your desire to go in, then engage with faith. And so these, these things are important. I also find it interesting too in Scripture after Yeshua had been resurrected, the people around him actually did not recognize him who he was until he spoke or until he revealed himself in the breaking of bread. There's two circumstances in the Bible. One on the road to Emmaus where the disciples' hearts burned in them when he shared the word. It wasn't until he broke bread that it unlocked who he was and the true revelation of, what, of who he was was seen. They don't say what he looked like. It says in the road to Mass, it says that Yeshua disappeared. And then when, he saw, when she saw Mary, sorry, when he saw Mary, and Mary said to her, Master, Yeshua says this. And then Yeshua said to her, don't touch me because I haven't ascended yet. And so, so for me, it's, it's that there is a unrecognizable change that is going to take place in us, not only spiritually, but also physically, where the reconstruction of our body to have that appearance of our God is going to come to such a point where those that we've been familiar with will not necessarily recognize us in our new form, but what will happen is our voice will frame the reality to open their eyes to behold the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. And so there's these things that, for me, I know are all being woven together by God in the realm of the kingdom world so that you and I can come into the experience of what we're going to be like. You, you and I are going to be, be framed in a different Im image than the one we currently bear. And so, so I want to talk about those four faces quickly just to go through them. So you have, you know, five minutes each. Just so you have a bit of background on what they are and how they function and how those faces really are connected to the seven spirits of God and how they, 
they kind of work into that process. Um, the first one, let's talk about the ox. So when the Bible talks about, you know, seeing the face of the ox, let's, let's talk about what the ox is. The ox, for me, is the, is the burden bearer. The, the ox is the one that bears your burdens. The ox is the one that trains you. The Bible talks about us yoking ourselves to Christ and being intrinsically woven into the lifestyle of engaging with Yahweh so that Yahweh can teach us about what it means to be in the field, to be laboring. The, for me, the ox is very symbolic of the burden bearer for humanity. And so as a son and as a, as a son of God, then our importance to be yoked to the ox, the ox literally is an ox. It's just like an ox face. The, the face of Yahweh turns to the ox, especially when his heart is burdened for humanity. I can remember having an encounter in Texas many years ago now um, with the, for the first time with the ox of God. I'd seen the face but never really experienced Yahweh's heart as the ox for the burden bearing of humanity. We were in this bank praying for an area in, in Texas there and and as we were praying this this being came into the room and I recognized it as the ox of God. Like it was literally in the room like an ox, but it was sort of, you know, eight foot high and its, its butt was out the other end of the wall and it was standing with its forelegs and its head inside the, inside the room and then it lowed, it just you know, this into the, into the area and territory that we were praying into and when it lowed, the sound of what was coming out of it and its hunger for relationship and the union it wants with humanity was all expressed in the way it lowed. And when it did that, I just, I literally fell to pieces crying, could not talk. I just could not talk. I did not know what to do. My whole heart had literally melted. And I was like, Yahweh, I don't know how to comfort you. You're the God of the universe. What do I need to do? And so I can remember when I was a young, young, young boy, when my, one of my dogs got hurt, I can remember just, just holding its neck and just cuddling it and that kind of thing. And I can remember turning and putting my arm underneath the, the kind of point of the ox's neck under here. And I mean, that's how big it was. Like I put my hand and didn't even go over the neck. I wasn't even around. It was just around this pointy piece. And I put my ear against the side of the ox's neck. And when I did that, the ox lowed again. And when it lowed, I felt the union with Yahweh's desire for those people to come into salvation, to experience the glory of God, to, to, to engage with Him for His calling, His wooing of their territory and that region back. And I, for about two hours, I just could not stop crying. And so they, 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 I, I realized that, that the ox of God is so, so, so important with regards to our future. And I believe that's why one of the key things with Moses was that they, they saw these horn-like appearances coming out. And that's why they made a golden calf. They actually made an ox in the fire at the bottom of the mountain, saying this led us out really because Moses was reflecting Yahweh and that thing was a deception of what was going to be going on with Moses. And so because Moses had become the burden bearer for humanity, really for Israelite people. So the ox has some, some really things. The Bible talks about how the fat of the ox breaks the yoke. Now, um, there's a really interesting way that... that um, People train an ox, they put a yoke on it when it's young, and very, very slowly as the ox grows, it gets neck gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then eventually the, the muscles and the strength within the ox will actually shatter the yoke, and then they have to put a new one on, on, on the ox. It's like the inner strength that comes from the ox breaks the yoke of the things that have been attached, and so as we engage with the, with the ox and with the face of Yahweh and minister through the name of God in engaging with the ox. Anything that we are yoked to that is not born in Christ, eventually the uh, union with Him will break those, will break those yokes. Um, an ox also is the burden bearer that carries humanity and bears humanity. It's also a symbol of of obedience you know an ox is a really really interesting animal it really once it's been trained it doesn't have a head of its own it'll just want to serve its master all the days of its life and it's happy just doing anything and an ox actually in when they used to use them in the old days to tow um you know they what they call them the carts where they used to take all their all their goods and stuff in um 
wagons. That was it. Sorry. I'm sorry for you Americans. Um, I can remember that reading books about how the oxen would, would toil away all day and sometimes without a break and they would actually troll themselves to death that they'd come to a point where they would get so exhausted they'd actually die. And it's, it's their desire to serve the, the humanity that was born out in the physical form in the physical world here with the oxes and the way they behaved. And so it's about obedient. Um, an ox also is very, very patient. You know, when a young ox is yoked to it in the way that they train another ox is they yoke another ox, young ox to the big ox. You have a two and a half thousand pound ox and a 500 pound ox and the small ox has been used to being out in the field. And when they yoke it to the big ox, the small ox is really interested for the first five minutes. It's like Christians, you know, really interested for the first five minutes. And then it's just work so, and engaging. So we don't really want to do that because we want something new now because it made us feel good. Well, what the, what the big ox does is the big ox literally trains the young ox to labor. Because no matter what the young ox did, the big ox would still work and walk, carry on doing what it's doing all day for eight hours a day, even though the young ox was kicking up a stink, squealing, putting its heels to the ground, being dragged along. You know, I mean, all of us have been there one time or another, kind of being dragged along by God, screaming and kicking. And, and, and Yahweh just is like, I mean, the ox is just like, who cares? You know, he's quite happy chewing his cud. He's had all his food from the morning and he's just labbing away in the field. And the small ox learned by the obedience of the big ox had to become obedient to the master. And so that's why you and I are yoked to Christ, or we should be yoked to Christ to be our rabbi so he can teach us and train us about our father. The, the um, ox is, a strength of, is, a, sorry, is an image of strength and endurance and is connected to the spirit of might. Um, I mean, that's written some notes I can't read here. E- each aspect of breaking the yoke, being a burden bearer, being obedient, being patient, each one of those aspects is actually part of the personality of our father himself. The, the next one is the eagle. So the eagle really is symbolized as, as liberty and majesty. I, I, I for years, I, for years, for about two years, I, I studied eagles. I read books about eagles. I, all the different eagles that there are, and the way that they move, and the way they fly, and what they do, and the, and just, I mean, they're they're astonishing. And I, I can remember doing some teachings on the eagle and just what they mean to us here spiritually. But the, an eagle really is the hunter. Um, the eagle is also one of the most intricate trainers of its young children in the way of flight. What a mother eagle does is he builds a nest. When she first builds it, she puts thorns inside her nest. And then um, she fills the top of the nest full of down. And then she lays the eggs in there. And of course, the babies get their food. They grow. So they hatch. They grow. They get their food. And it gets to a point where a baby eagle has to learn how to fly. And to make the baby, because if the baby eagle didn't learn how to fly, it would require the mother to feed it for the rest of its life. And so what the mother does is she takes the down out of the nest very slowly until the thorns started to come through at the bottom of the nest. And now it's very uncomfortable for the baby eagle to be on the nest. And the base of the nest, so the baby eagle now has to sit on the side of the nest. Eventually what the mother does, when the baby eagle's been flapping its wings for a couple of weeks or whatever it is, the mother eagle will actually pick the young, child, young eagle up, take it up to about 25,000 feet and drop it. And then, like, I mean, and it's like the first time I ever saw it, it freaked me out that the mother was going to eat her child until I realized what she would do is that she would allow the, the, the young eagle to fall for three or 4,000 feet. And in the meantime, she was descending with the child like this. And then she would come up underneath the child, get the, the baby eagle on its back and rise up like this and then drop the baby again. And then she would swoop down next to the baby and pick it up and rise it up like this and then drop it again. She did it three or four or five times and return the baby to the nest for the next one. And, and I think it's after three days, the baby eagle learns how to fly. I mean, I, I kind of figure I would if God was doing that to me. And so there, there's some things about the eagle that's, that's just important. The, it's that an eagle is very, very patient as well. Um, somehow the mother eagle seems to have this 
intrinsic connection with her chicks where she encourages the chicks to grow, to hunt. She trains them. She shows them. It's really, the eagle is a really close discipler of, of those that are around what she's doing and the chicks that she has. And for me, it's like the Holy Spirit is very much like that. He's like the trainer that Yahweh wants to train us into to become something that's expressive, that can soar into the high places and go 40,000 feet up and, and see and observe and from a position way up to observe creation. I mean, the eagle has many, many facets to it that are just important. The eagle also is the nest builder. She will build her nest and become very, very flexible within, the, within that. Um, Yeah, I've described the eagle here as free and uninhibited. The, the object of the eagle is to reveal the glory of God. So the, the eagle is also represented by the spirit of wisdom and knowledge. The ox is represented by might. I'm sorry, I missed that. So let's talk about man. Let's talk about man here. Um, man, the symbolism within the four faces of Yahweh, Man is expressed through vulnerability, having, having the ability to be emotionally empathic with your things that you, you walk through within your life. So when Yahweh presents himself in the form of a man, and by the way, I've also met the eagle, had an encounter with the actual image of Yahweh as the eagle, um, very, very similar to the issue with the ox. One of the key things that has happened with me is meeting Yahweh face to face as a man in the garden. When I, when I talked about walking in Eden and all that kind of stuff year and year and years ago, um, to meet with him as a man, when Yahweh presents himself as a man, he literally steps out of the, I call it the zone of thunder and fire. He literally steps out of that zone of thunder and fire and lightning and takes on the form of a man so that we can relate to him in that arena. Because when Yahweh presents himself as a man, he's really making himself vulnerable, um, able to have expression one to another, um, enables him really to understand the vulnerability of our flesh and the way we function as a being and, and is empathic and emotionally connected to what we're doing. So it can sense things that are, are happening around. I can remember the first time meeting Yahweh in the garden and, and, and having that entanglement with him, walking with him in the rose garden and the wonder of experience of just standing next to God and then feeling what Yahweh was doing. And I share some of this in some of those tapes that are walking in Eden. And so I can remember engaging with some of this stuff and, and walking my way through the four faces of God, getting to relate with our God in what I would call every one of his modes um, and experiencing them. Um, and so the man really is, for me, is connected to um, the spirit of understanding and counsel. The, the last one here is the lion. So the lion is fierce, and it's a predatory, fierce protector of all that is within the pride. Um, I, again, I spent years looking at lions, studying lions, trying to get to grips with the aspect of Yahweh being a lion, this fierce, roaring protector of the pride and the way that I... The difference between a male and female, I can remember talking about this in, in Marius's church, the, in a Mother's Day meeting, actually, talking about the lionesses, how a lion's claws are different in a female than a male. The way that a female hunts is different than the way a male hunts. Um, the, male, the female's claws are made to, to hook in, and they've got little, little curls on them. They're made to hook in, to hold on, where males, male lion's claws are designed to rip and to tear, and, and, and the male lion is designed to roar into the ground. The female lion is designed to look after the cubs, and a female will give her life for her cubs where a male lion won't. And so there's all this behavior that goes on with the pride of a lion that, that empowers Yahweh to become what he's got to be around us here in the aspect of, of being the lion. And so here's the, it's just, for me, it's described as the fierce protector. It's about kingship, about rulership. A, a lion will also establish boundaries. So when you, when you go into the felt in Africa, 
you, you find that, that there are prides of lions in different places and they establish boundaries for that pride and they protect their boundary like it's, um, and like, but it's hundreds of square kilometers that they protect. They just kind of walk around and mark their territory and when another lion comes into that arena, they go after them, you know, and that's why they fight for, they fight for their territory. One of the things, the aspects of God that I so, so appreciate is that the more we yield to Him, the greater the arena of protectiveness that comes over us and around us, where Yahweh will purposely protect us because we're part of the pride of the Lion of Judah. And, and so he, he overshadows us, he watches us, he roars over us. I, the, the, the Lion, is, to me, is, is a terrifying beast, but it's the most loving and amazing with all of its cubs. It, you know, sometimes it will give its life to try and provide, you know, which is what Yeshua really did. He gave his life to provide a way for us. And so you have all these things that are woven into the, the way a lion behaves. The, um, the, the, lion, the lion also has the ability to establish lordship and fear, like the dominion power of a lion is amazing. When, when, when a lion, I can remember walking into the trophy room of Satan many years ago, to, to after going after something and don't recommend you do it unless Yahweh has you do it. But I, you know, I do a teaching on it. But I can remember thinking about a lion, what a lion does when it walks into the felt in Africa. Like all the animals are fine as long as they can see the lion. They will carry on eating and a couple of them will be watching. But the problem is the moment a lion disappears, all the animals know someone's going to die. And then they all get alert. They all start getting agitated and all this kind of stuff. And it's because it's not, it's not just because the way a lion is with its strength of what it does eating in the, in, the, in the field in Africa. But what it does is that it strikes fear because there is a record of what has gone on in the past woven into their genetics. And you, you and I need to know that when Yahweh engages with us in the form of a lion, in the genetics of everything that is not connected to him and what he's doing, a terror gets installed into them because they know that someone's going to get a beaten. You know, the stuff's going to go on when Yahweh begins to engage, especially when he hides us, when he overshadows us, when he covers us with his wings, when he, when he protects us and draws us into himself and holds us inside of him. Then, then something's going to die. You know, that's just a fact of life. And so... One of, the, one of the key scriptures that, um, sorry, the, the, the lion is connect, connected to authority and dominion, kingship, rulership, and establishes boundaries. The um, two spirits of the seven spirits of God that, that is connected to is the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And so really it's that dominion engaging to find the place where Yahweh can do what he has to do. So, so how, how do I, as a person then and as a being in a practical way, how, how do I engage with these things? So literally facing, going Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, literally facing and engaging with the lion to present myself within my father through that aspect to be able to roar, carrying all the record of these things, the, the boundary keeper, the establishment of boundaries, the rulership, the kingship, the lordship, the establishing dominion and might, engaging with Yod. So when I'm going Yod, I'm engaging with the lion of Yahweh to actually have those things revealed around my life. Then I'll go here, hey, so I'm engaging with the lion, but the ox of God, which is to do with everything to do with, with, with the thing that breaks the yoke, the one that bears my burdens, the one that is obedient, that's patient, that's kind, that there's about strength and endurance. And so I'm engaging with the ox in the same way. So when I go, hey, I'm engaging through the ox to have those things materialize around my life. I do the same thing with the eagle and the same thing with a man. And I found by doing that 15 minutes a day, just... Even even in the car, like you've just got to be careful when you're driving, you're doing some of this stuff. Um, I've had a few people that have freaked out because of what starts to happen in their car and they've got to drive to the side of the road. But if you can handle that measure that Yahweh wants to reveal himself in you, for me, when I get in my car and I've got a 15 or 20 minute drive, 
I'll just start going, yud hey vav hey while I'm driving my car, but in my mind and heart, I'm entangling myself into the expression of the lion, the ox, the eagle, the man. It's going to be really interesting one day. I don't really know when it may happen, but I'm darn sure it's going to one day. I'll be driving in my car going, lion, ox, eagle, man, yod, hey, vav, hey, yod, hey, vav, hey, yod, hey. And I have no doubt my face is going to start going, lion, ox, eagle, man. I don't know what's going to happen when the person driving beside me or alongside coming the other way is going to see this lion, ox, eagle, man, and a white glorified light in my car. I kind of figure, as he is, so are we in this life. I have a scripture for you to finish with, guys. In 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 49, it says this, As we have borne the image of the earthly, so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. The word have borne, the image of the earthly, the word born there means to be revealed and seen. And so as we have been revealed and seen in the image of the earthly being, we also shall bear or be revealed and seen in the image of the heavenly. Our Father looks weird. That's all I have to say about this. Our Father looks weird. But man, it's amazing. Not only does He look weird, I have some really good news for you and some really bad news for you that you too are going to look weird one day. I'm looking forward to the time when we start getting texts on the on the, on the thing, hey, hey, Ian, today, my, I was looking in the mirror going, yod, hey, vav, hey, and my face turned to a lion. What do I do? I said, carry on. <laughs>